you everybody. Um, my name is Philip Peavy. Uh, I'm from Amberlight and we are a specialist user centre design consultancy. We've been doing that kind of work since 2000 and working on projects with um, children since about 2002. Um, more recently we found an increased demand in specialist services around UX, UCD, specifically around children. Um, so we're going to talk about some of our thoughts around that and experiences. Um, there are indeed four of us, so I'm joined here by my colleagues um, Mancha and George, who have recently been doing some research with children, and um, a, a colleague of ours, Gemma from the BBC, who we've been working with and will be presenting um, a case study and some of the uh, things that came out of that as part of the talk. Um, okay, um, before we go into some guidelines and sort of good practice for research um, and design in the case study, I just want to talk about some of the things we've been thinking about when it comes to doing UX for very young children. Um, my personal experience, my generation, so um, my first experience of a, of a computer was um, roughly at the age of seven. Um, it was at school. It was an Acon Electron, and to this day, I do not know what this computer does. <laughs> um, first computer I owned was roughly around the age of nine, and going around what my friends were doing at the time, that seems around normal, and that was a Commodore Plus 4, wasn't connected to the internet, didn't do that much. Um, I think these days, when we look at kids, they're really born into a household that already has computers and technology, they're exposed to it from the age of zero. They may not know what computers are, but they're certainly there. And one of the things that I think has changed in recent years is, is that now they're able to interact with them from as early as 12 months. You know, even a few years ago, when we had keyboards and a mouse, that age would have been much higher, maybe five or six. But now, really, they can interact with them right away. And this is largely thanks to devices like this one, the tablet. This has really transformed how kids interact with technology. Um, I'm going to try and play a little video. Hopefully this will work. make it a little bit bigger. And this is, um, if you go on YouTube and you look at children and infants and technology, you'll see more and more videos like this. You know, and if we sit back and think about it for a while, we're talking about a kid that's one year old, one, 12 months, and already the way they interact with technology is shaping the way they see the whole world around them. So, hopefully we've got some sound. iPad, no problem, does what it's supposed to do. Magazine, what is this about? It doesn't work, it's broken. What about this one? Nope. So, her exposure with the iPad is actually shaping how she interacts with all objects around her. She can't speak, she can't read, she can't really communicate in any other way, but already she's able to interact with a tablet and expects other objects to behave in the same way. <laughs> so already as designers we should be thinking, my God, this has so many implications around the work that we do and should be doing. How do you conduct research? How do you ask this user what she expects from the next app? All very interesting questions. <coughs> so, um, some recent um, facts um, from uh, digging around the internet. So, according to Ofcom, 51% of houses in the UK now have tablets. 61% of three-year-olds are using tablets, either at school or nursery. Uh, if you look at two-year-olds, that figure is as high as 38%, according to Ofcom. Um, even five years ago in 2010, a study that looked at the best-selling iBooks on um, the Apple App Store uh, found that 81% of the best-selling titles were all kids' titles. Um, so even then, this trend was beginning. Um, and about a third of parents say their kids can use an iPad better than they can. Um, 
you know, in the media there's lots of stories, lots of observers saying basically, you know, if you have an iPad and a kid, they're going to be using it way more than you are. And this is definitely very true in my experience. So much so that there are now at least four or five uh, products, iPad products, designed specifically at children. And collectively in 2013, uh, parents spent over £3 billion on tech gadgets for their kids. Um, okay, so we have to ask ourselves the question, is this a good thing? Because obviously interacting with technology from a young age shapes that child. How does it impact their social skills? Is it good for their posture? How does it rewire their brain compared to previous generations? Um, we don't really know, but there are some groups out there that are concerned about this. So at a recent conference of teachers and lecturers, uh, one teacher talked about um, how in nursery kids are coming in and they can swipe an iPad but they're lacking basic physical manipulation skills you'd expect at that age, such as manipulating blocks or tying shoelaces. Um, with older children, teachers are saying they're losing the ability to really learn for paper exams and not retaining knowledge in the same way because they're so used to having information at their fingertips. Um, you know, in the first three years of growing up, the brain is really wiring up and learning a lot of new skills. And if kids are now interacting with technology and spending a lot of time with it, that may be impacting the way that happens. Um, there's reports that some young children are becoming addicted and need treatment. Um, and there are guidelines on um, screen use with children, but a lot of these are outdated and related to television. Um, in another international uh, bit of research, they found that 23% of children aged 2 to 5 can make a mobile call. 25% can navigate websites, 20% can use a smartphone, 66% can turn on a computer, 73% can use a mouse, but only 11% can tie their shoelaces, and about a third can write their full name, first name and surname. So the milestones we used to use for tracking a child's development are changing. They're now becoming digital ones and replacing the old ones. Of particular concern uh, for teachers is children coming into school looking really tired like zombies. And there are guidelines now coming out to inform parents to turn off Wi-Fi at night and to confiscate tablets because the kids will take them to bed and use them all night long. <coughs> this is the case of a four-year-old where the parents contacted a psychiatrist because they were so worried about the child's compulsive behaviour because she was in, uh, addicted to a tablet device. Um, a student at UCL recently looked at posture and also found concern because children don't necessarily pick up <coughs> devices with their hands. They'll put them on a flat surface and then sort of lean over. And particularly in schools, teachers don't realise some of the potential long-term uh, damage that can be done to the spine and back because they haven't been trained. iPads should actually be used at an angle and propped up so you don't have to turn your neck. But it's easier for the teacher to see what they're doing and they're not trained, so some of this is happening at the moment. Of course, there are many people who believe the benefits far outweigh some of these concerns, and all of these can be overcome. I'm, I'm definitely one of those people. Um, these children are learning the important IT skills for the workplace of tomorrow. And you know, educating in a fun and interactive way can hold the child's attention for a lot longer so they learn a lot more. Um, also, the apps can give feedback immediately to the child, which can enhance their learning, something a book cannot do. And also, the apps can track their progress over time and report that to a teacher or a parent, again, something that books cannot do. And there's many studies that show um, you know, really great results with children with special needs and learning disabilities that were thought impossible with previous means of education. Um, there are now also nurseries that hand out an iPad to every single child. And they claim this really enhances their learning, so long as it's just one of the tools that they're using. Um, and they're still using traditional means as well. Um, there's now um, departments that are beginning to research the impact on child's development from a young age from using technology, in particular tablets. Um, one of those centres is in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and this chap here, he believes that even though the brain is rewiring itself, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It may be rewiring itself in a good way. And children are learning um, certain cognitive skills much earlier. Um, he makes the point also that, you know, not so long ago, people were saying the same thing about books, that books were bad for children. It would damage their eyes. Um, but now we all obviously believe that books are the source of all knowledge and actually very good for children. 
Um, so these are just some of the things we need to think about when we design apps, because you know we can overcome some of these issues with good design and at least educate other people who are part of the product design process about what they should be thinking about. But I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Ranch, uh, George, <laughs> Thank you. Um, who's going to talk about some research techniques for children. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm George Green, I'm a consultant at Amberlight, and my goal really tonight is to impart some very practical tips if you're thinking of doing research with children, um, you know, so, um, trying to arm you with some tools that can kind of help you do that confidently. Because when I first got into this and started doing research with children, um, this is how I much felt. Um, so. <laughs> Just to kind of overview of what I'm going to talk about here, as I said, I'll give you some practical tips um, and go into a bit more detail about how you really interact with children, what you do at the start of the session, all these kind of things, um, and how you can build rapport to keep things moving along. So I think um, it's already been said tonight that children are surprisingly busy. And um, you know they have schedules. Uh, and uh, you know they don't make good part research participants if they're asleep <laughs> or uh, eating. So it, you, know, you need to think about these kind of things when you're planning your research sessions. And who's going to be there? Because um, you know if you're doing it in the home, if they're if they're sort of not the normal people, then that's going to change things, and you you won't have a naturalistic uh, type of setup. So it's just some just some things that you know you might not have thought of. And uh, when we looked into doing research, we thought, well, we have so much to cover. How can we do that? These children have such short attention spans. But what we figured out is that you can actually get away with doing a very long session if you take a few steps. Because you can uh, go to the children's homes. They'll be much more relaxed. And that sort of help you, um, help you keep them engaged for longer. And uh, one of the things is, you be a bit flexible about what actually happens in a session. Um, essentially, you just have no investment in it at all because y y it's not going to happen anyway. So um, that's this is one of the things that can keep you keep you moving on that for a long time. And as I was saying, you know, you'll you'll prepare your discussion guide. You'll have a million and one questions to ask. Okay, you're probably going to end up throwing it all away because once you get into that session, children dance to their own tune and. Um, you know, you're not the boss anymore, um, <laughs> essentially. And, uh, you know, when it comes to that, when it comes to maintaining that kind of discipline, and so basically you should, you should not try to do that. Just hand that over to the parent and outsource it to them. And you can get into it, you know, the, you can be the good cop, and it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice one to be, because you're the one with all the fancy toys, <laughs> and you try and make them feel important. And, uh, as I say, to be flexible about what gets covered, it can make things run a lot more smoothly. And then things can happen, like you can find you've got, instead of, instead of the one child, you have multiple children. And uh, you treat that as a bonus, because you get double the data with that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, that's actually something that is quite naturalistic. You can see them interacting together with the product. And uh, it's, a, it's a bonus. So when you're starting off your session, and I think the first thing to think about is we, we don't want to force these children to you know, be participants. Uh, try and get some kind of consent. Say, you know, this is what we're trying to do. We need your help we're trying to make things better here on, a, you know, on this particular app or, or whatever it is you're testing. And you know, I think it's really just to offer that respect and treat them as equals, which is very important. And you know, you'll find that there are different types of parents involved. And uh, the one to be really uh, aware of is uh, the aspirational parent who has a child genius. <laughs> and, you know, they'll get you into all kinds of trouble. So, um, you know, I think it's head that off at the pass and uh, explain that, you know, when, when little Johnny can't get to do what he wants to do, um, then that's all part of the process. It's super useful for you. And you know, to allow those issues to play out a little bit. And um, that, you know, th they can help, and they will help. Um, but, uh, you know, I think if you can, you can convey, it needs to play out so that you can make it better and see 
how to improve it. So when you're in your session, and um, something I think, when I first got into this, I glossed over because we're just so ready with all my questions and my kit and my, my prototype, I just wanted to get right in there. But I think it pays dividends to spend a little bit of time building rapport with the child. Because what you find is sometimes they're super confident and you don't need that. And other times, um, you know, they clam up and um, you can spend a little bit of time um, saying, okay, show me your room, show me your favorite toy, show me your DVD cases and all these things. And the way to get them to open up is you can build a little bit of rapport with the parent first, then the child and parent together, and then that gives you a bridge to interact with the child alone and they'll be, they'll be comfortable with you. And when you're actually interacting with these children, um, it's, there's some special considerations there. So um, the first thing you're going to want to do is ask them to explain what they've done and why they like things. And you'll, you'll have a million questions because, because you're doing research. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that says it all because uh, you, know, you'll, you, you will not get explanations. And um, you, you just have to observe, really. And that's what... Um, because they, they, they can't give them. They don't have that sort of metacognitive ability. Uh, when you're communicating with children, uh, you need to use simple words. It's easy to forget, you know, to say something like, um, so what do you think of this interface, you know, interaction? You know, we're using these words all the time, throwing them around the office, but um, to children, they don't, especially very young children, they don't really mean anything. And the parents are your best friends in this situation because they're great two-way translators. You, they will tell you what the child just said to you, <laughs> and they can also tell the child what you just said. So um, they, they're really your best friends. And when uh, you know when when the child is struggling, you really need to. They can very quickly kind of break down and um, uh, you know with the slightest criticism. So um, you you need to be encouraging. Um, so if there's issues, you can sort of say, wow, this is great, this has never happened before. And it becomes like a really fun adventure that you're discovering this stuff, and you can sort of really inspire them with that. So I just want to now go into a few of the sort of methods you can think about, because you've, you've got your questions, you've got your practical tips, but uh, what are you going to do with all that, and, and how, do you, um, how do you sort of put this together in a methodological way? And one of the sort of uh, techniques which I don't take any credit for is uh, peer tutoring um, and this is where you, you have one child explain to another one what, uh, what they're doing and how they're using a the product and that gives you a nice window on their thought process and their understanding of what's going on and it, it's, it's very natural and um, it's quite powerful. The other thing you can do is you know, we all have, we use rating scales sometimes, but they don't really work with young children. They're not capable of understanding that, um, and that's, that's been shown that they don't really work. So, so what instead you need to do, is, the, and they can do, is create a ranking and say, uh, which do you prefer of these two? And they can say, yes, I like this one. And, you know, they'll give you an answer to that. And you can keep on doing that. As long as there's only two or three ideas, um, that's something they can do. So how do you go about inferring? As I said, they can't give you explanations. So from all this research, you need to establish what your needs are, and then you can, you can design with that. And those needs, as I said, it's more a case of observing what needs, because your children will act out. Um, if they're engaged, you should know. If they're not engaged, they're probably not doing whatever it is you're trying to get them to do. Um, and, and they've given up. And that tells you something, that's great. And that's where that flexibility comes in because when they want to go and check something out, else out, then what is it and, and why? And, and you can try and draw the patterns and say, um, what is it that makes that so, so interesting and, and fun and engaging? And I would sort of say that um, it's something you need to be even more careful with because, as I say, you don't just observe, you don't get those explanations. So this is an even less exact science than it is with adults, but it's still just as important because at the end of the day you want to build something that you know, is built on the needs of these children. 
So with that, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Gemma Manuel, who's going to introduce the actual um, case study with the BBC. Okay, okay so um, my job at the BBC is as senior design researcher, so I work with the guys you saw earlier, Liz and Liam, to kind of run the research that we do around the products that we're working on. The case study that we're going to talk through today is for the Storytime app, which the Anna's already mentioned. Um, it's obviously meant to be fun and engaging for the kids, but also educational. So there's a lot of thinking that's gone into it. Um, as Diana said, it launched in 8 August 2014, and it's been really successful. Um, and we've had loads of great feedback. But, as always, we want to make it even better and look at how we can improve it. Um, so we've been working with Amberlight on this project where we've done quite extensive research into not just our Storytime app, but other apps that are out there um, and kind of the educational basis that we've built on, but also keeping them fun and interactive. Um, and kind of it's not just about it being a truly, truly great reading app, it's something that you can get the parent and the child and siblings involved in. So we're quite interested in looking at those relationships as well and how that works. In terms of um, what we're really keen to find out, um, so obviously we wanted to know which content was most appealing to the children um, and the parents as well, so what, what would parents recommend their children to read. Um, we also wanted to know how they were actually interacting with the features and functionality of these apps that they were using, what worked well, what didn't. Um, we wanted to know which of those interactions were most delightful to the children, what, what would keep it engaging and entertaining for them. Um, is there anything we can learn from the competition? So the, the landscape as a whole, what, what's everyone else doing? What can we learn from them? Um, and what opportunities are there for us to improve our current app as well? And I think one of the key things for me as well, like you've already mentioned, um, is around the feedback that we get. Um, so a lot of the feedback we get is from parents who want to tell us how amazing their children are. Um, and we wanted to dig a little bit underneath that and work out kind of actually how is this working, not just how are people telling us this is working. So we've done a four-stage research project. Um, we started off with an extensive competitor review, and that not only looked across the landscape at what else was out there, but also included a SWOT analysis, so we could look at kind of where the gaps and opportunities for us to grow our product. We did some contextual in-home sessions, um, and some of the things that came into that were the, the kind of interactions between parent and child and siblings and that kind of thing. The people who took part in the contextual in-home sessions then completed a diary study for us, which helped us look at not just that one-time interaction with the product, but actually after that first interaction, how does that change? How do they grow with the product once they get a bit more used to it? And where does it fit into their lives as well? So not just in a setting where we're forcing them to look at it, but what are they doing in real life? So are they in the back of the car having the tablet thrown at them to keep them quiet? Or are they sitting with their parents at night reading a story in the kind of traditional way that you might do with a book? Um, and then we, we've run a quantitative survey just to kind of feed in some of the ideas and recommendations that have come out of the more qualitative work and validate some of that thinking. Um, in terms of who we spoke to, um, it was children aged two to six as the kind of core audience that we were talking to, but we were really interested as well in how this filtered out wider into the family. So parents, siblings, even friends if it was relevant, we were really interested in how that worked. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Marcia to tell you all about the exciting findings. Thanks Gemma. Thank you Philip. So uh, I work as a senior consultant on this project and I'd like to share with you some of our findings that Gemma approved of us sharing with all of you. Uh, so we spent a lot of time on this project. As you can see here, we spent over 200 hours talking to people and collecting and gathering data. We reviewed around 25 educational apps, so it went beyond just, the, uh, just beyond BBC's offerings. We looked at what else was out there, competitors. And we did sessions uh, with 17 children, the contextual sessions that Gemma spoke about a little while ago. And we also collected feedback from parents across the UK. So um, I'm going to tell you about some recommendations we had for story apps specifically. And for obvious reasons, it's quite generic uh, since it's an ongoing project, but hopefully you'll find these helpful. So to start with, let's talk about the story collection offered in story apps. Now, if you go and have a look at 
any app store and have a look at some of the story apps, they, many of them describe themselves as here you find stories for kids five and under or three and under. But like what Liz mentioned earlier, what you need to bear in mind is that there is a massive difference between say what a two-year-old likes and what a five-year-old likes. It's not the same thing at all. So if we are talking about younger children, say three and under, what we, what we observed that was what works for them is short stories with many simple interactions. They want to be engaged constantly. So if there are long narratives, they get bored and they just get distracted by something else after a point. So they need to be stimulated constantly with sights and sounds and animation, lots of things to tap around. So keep the narrative uh, brief, but give them a lot of interactions. Uh, and as for the older children, say four plus, uh, they would like more complex uh, interactions, a longer, uh, more interesting narrative. And some uh, interactions that we saw were really popular were things like the story maker functionality, where the child can himself or herself make a story, record their own voice, move around characters, that sort of thing. Then moving on to narration. Now generally for grown-ups, we like a clear, a consistent sort of narration, doesn't have to be too fancy, but that sort of thing does not work for kids, surprise, surprise. What they would like is a really lively, very engaging narration. So um, one thing to bear in mind is for kids who are young, so say toddlers, three and younger, uh, their narration should be based on short sentences. Again, this is related to the previous point about the stories not being very long. And they love repetition, like the first video that we saw today that Leanne shared with us. They can just keep pressing the same thing over and over again, and they love it. Well, fine, if that works for them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, employ techniques from Motheries. For those of you who are not familiar with what uh, Motheries is, it's a communication technique used by adults and uh, children, uh, young children specifically, to help the child develop uh, their language skills. So um, some of the tips that Madhuri's uh, provides us with, one, one example is to exaggerate phonetic cues. So this is a dog. That's sort of very over the top way of narrating. So that's very useful and very engaging for young kids. And another really good plus point about using Madhuri's is it's also very beneficial to kids who are on the autistic spectrum. So it's a win-win. We highly recommend using that for our apps aimed at younger children. Tapping an item. Now, tapping is a very, very natural, very intuitive interaction for our preschoolers. They see anything and they're very happy to prod on it and see what happens like we saw in the other uh, video earlier today. And uh, this can be really used to your advantage in a story app. So rather than just presenting a block of text, you could have the child tap on a character and here are its lines. So instead of this not very nice way of presenting a story for a two-year-old. You could instead, like in the previous picture, you could tap on a character and then see what the character has to say. So it also encourages uh, uh, the child discovering things. So for example, in this case, the uh, child could tap on multiple elements on the screen and then this, uh, the app vocalizes what they just tapped on. So this is a balloon, this is a tree, that sort of thing. And speaking of uh, big blocks of text, uh, the text should be made child friendly. So uh, I know it's obvious to all of us out here that text should be legible, it should be clear, of course. But for kids especially, ensure that the typeface is large, it's clear, and it's easy to read. So this is an example from the story time app. As you can see, the text is highlighted. It's a very cute, child friendly typeface, and it's uh, it, it's it's um, highlighted so that it's, it doesn't get lost in the graphics there. While this is not very clear, I can barely see, read it myself standing here in front of a giant screen. I don't see how a two-year-old would be able to handle that. And again, speaking of text highlighting, it's a really nice feature to have because the child can see the word that's being spoken out aloud. But we'd also suggest allow, uh, allowing parents to deactivate it if uh, they wanted to read the story aloud with the child at their own pace. Then navigation. Now, all of us in here, we are wired to think of navigation as make it prominent, make it obvious. It should be immediately available to the user. Take all of that, throw it out, turn it on its head when it comes to designing navigation for kids in story apps. This time around, navigation cues should not be obvious immediately. 
And this is because uh, we saw during all the uh, research sessions we did for this project that when the navigation cues are obvious, so when there are these big green forward arrow and backward arrow, the first thing the child does is after a point they're just bored with whatever story is going on, they see this big bright button, start tapping on it, and they lose all interest in the story at that point. Um, one of the apps that takes care of this problem really well is um, Three Little Pigs by Nosy Crow, and it's really clever what they have done. So this is what the child sees while they're reading the story, and I'm not sure if you can see this clearly just yet, but there are navigation cues actually available on the screen right now. There's a forward, backwards, and the home button, but it's translucent. Right? The opacity is very, very low. Now, when the parent is using this app with the child, the parent can see the, uh, the navigation cues. So for, if I, for any reason they need to navigate, or if the child is bored, they can do that, but the child does not get distracted by it. And this is my favorite bit. Once the story is ready to proceed, the forward arrow becomes opaque and it starts, it starts bouncing up and down, immediately grabbing the child's attention and the child knows that, okay, now is when I move to the next page. Really done very well. And sort of related to that is parental controls. Now, um, these days, most of the apps, most of the apps aimed at kids have parental controls, some sort of a, you know, add one plus one to get into enough purchases, that sort of thing. So that's something everyone's aware of, but how you design this is also key to keep in mind. These parental controls should be designed in such a way that the, I'm talking about the call to action to the parent's area. Uh, it should be designed in such a way that it's accessible to the parent, but not immediately obvious to the child. It should not distract or it should not be enticing to the child. And again, we have two examples here. In this app, as you can see here, uh, this unlock app and um, access the parent section, not very obvious compared to these big colorful books out here. And this app, this is a story app and what it does is um, it's sort of like a video so the story just keeps playing on and when the child, um, there are no interactions in the story so the child cannot tap on anything but child, kids love tapping on things so they tap on the screen and the first thing that appears is this giant control. Now tell me which is the most interesting bit on that screen at this point. Kids end up tapping on those, cold, on those controls, the story stops and that's it, there goes your story. And again, um, this was mentioned earlier in the evening, kids have a very short att attention span, especially toddlers. So for stories, rather than making it a long saga, uh, we suggest um, interspersing the story with different activities. So break down the story into chunks and separate each chunk with a small little activity like a mini game or a puzzle related to the story, related to the narrative. Um, I'd like to just quickly go over some interactions that you could consider using for these uh, little activities. And these were interactions that we saw were the most popular. Um, we saw that kids across the board love putting things together, putting components together, and you'd be surprised, or maybe not, even two-year-olds were really, really good at this. So it could be something like um, making your own robot, or it could even be like bake your own pizza. So kids love putting things together. Soundboards, no surprises here, but then kids really like anything that makes noise. So tap a button, he'll, you know, wah, some sort of noise that goes with it. That sort of thing was extremely popular. Dragging and dropping. And matching items, so matching colors, matching shapes, uh, kids like that a lot. And um, before we end the talk, I'd like to also remind you that these, what we spoke about so far was specifically for story apps, but we also need to bear general guidelines for designing uh, apps for children. And I'll just quickly cover a few of them. Uh, bear in mind that these are young kids with potty fingers and they haven't, they don't really have the motor skills or the dexterity to a pinpoint on things as such. So make sure your um, touch hotspots are large enough for them to be able to tap. And related to that point is kids often do this. And um, so be, you know, prepare for unintended multi-touch gestures. Like for example, on the iPad, we saw often that kids do this on their tablet and it, they just exit the app. So think of ways in which you can get around that. Is there some way developers can disable that or some sort of a message that comes up to get them back on the app? So think of that as well. 
And uh, also, again, we're talking about preschoolers and toddlers here. Most of them don't read just yet. So think of uh, including audio calls to action and audio and sound indications of now's the time to move on to the next page of the story. <coughs> um, yep, so that's all I have. And before we end the session, Philip would like to add a little note. <laughs> um, yeah, just to wrap up, I mean, children are wonderful humans to work with. And if you have the pleasure of working with them in UX, it's a real joy. Um, however, it is very much a specialist area. We see it as an area where there's special ethical considerations, um, the design guidelines you consider for adults, you might as well throw them out and you need to sort of look at specialist design guidelines for children and also the research techniques. You may have been doing UX research for 10 years with adults, but you may need to undergo new training in order to do it effectively with children. And we don't really claim to know all that much about it. It's a growing field and we're constantly learning. The really exciting thing is it's changing so fast because technology is becoming so much more accessible for children. So I guess the message out there is if you do get to work with children, you know, do look at these guidelines, do a web search, and you know, learn about the best practice that's out there so you can bring that to the project. Thank you very much for listening. That's really